Hey, Scott, we got Aaron on the line. What do you want to ask him? What do you think about the future of multifamily in the next three to five years? Why do you believe in it? Why do you think it's a solid buy? What are you telling your investors? The reason I got into real estate originally was because people need a roof over their head, whether there's a recession or not. Even in the worst real estate recession, people were still buying houses. They still need a place to live. You know, over the next uh, three to five years, I think the market's going to come back. I think we're going to see about 18 months of hardship. Um, I think multifamily housing, the class B and C space is just going to kind of sail along. I think it's actually a good, really good shelter from the storm right now if owning apartment buildings. I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast, and this podcast is different than everything else out there. I bring together a new and an experienced investor on each episode, and I let the aspiring investor ask the questions that they need answered. So if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably will have the exact same questions. Now, before we get to this episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and that little bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. Uh, very excited for today's show. It's another one of our Ask the Expert episodes. And we got two great people on the line with us. We got Aaron Fragnito as our experienced investor today and Scott Matthews as our aspiring investor today. So um, first of all, gentlemen, welcome to the show. And Aaron, you're up first. So do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, Brian. Thanks for having me on tonight. Great. Glad to be a guest here. Um, so yeah, I actually got started in real estate as a real estate agent. Um, I uh, majored in entrepreneurship at Rowan University mm -hmm. uh, a little over a decade ago or so. And I uh, always wanted to own my own business. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, in college, which mm -hmm. probably gave me more knowledge and uh, direction than my $100,000 college degree. But yep. uh, you know, the it's like the, the day, entrepreneur's Bible right there. <laughs> it's a really incredible book. You know, I learned how to use uh, the bank's money to pay yourself, how to work the tax code to uh, essentially pay zero tax. And, um, you know, so yeah, I got started in real estate as a realtor, though, in 2010, it was just a dismal market and uh, really learned how to um, be successful in a bad market by selling short sales and REO properties um, and dealing with investors, you know, working with investors there and learning how they they work transactions. And uh, that was a great introduction to real estate. It really allowed me to learn how to make uh, income, make returns and buy great deals in a terrible market. Uh, one of which I don't think we'll see for a long time. Uh, just an incredible real estate recession there. So just um, really a good experience overall, but really hard during it. Boy, oh boy, was it hard to make money at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, that's one thing. And I mean, Interesting because a lot of people are predicting, you know, recessions and turbulent times in the next couple of years. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot of a uh, lot of lessons learned there. So um, interesting entrepreneurship as a, a major. The school I went to, I don't think they, they have that option. Um, my, I, I think it would have been very helpful for me to have some formal education on that. But yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so interesting. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, yeah. you know, I learned, I, I don't think I really learned how to be a successful entrepreneur. I mean, that's such a vague word. It's like, you know, how to be smart, you know, I was like, <laughs> you can't necessarily teach that, but I learned what a credit and a debit was. I learned what a franchise was. I learned how to show up and work hard and study for an exam. Uh, you know, I learned how to drink beer upside down. Uh, so a lot of different things I learned in college that are phenomenal. Well, yeah. Least today. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice. So, um, you know, get, getting into real estate, what, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome, you know, getting into this business? Well, um, building credibility, you know, raising capital, starting real estate syndication was the hardest thing I've ever done in, in real estate, really in business mm -hmm. in general. Um, so, you know, being a realtor was actually a pretty good gig. I got to say, after about three years, I was making six figures. Uh, I was moving deals. I was working about seven days a week, trying to start a team, ripping my hair out with that. And mm -hmm. um, then I had to pay the government like 30 grand and mm -hmm. I didn't have it. So I had to go sell houses for three months to pay the government. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Like that's why I got into this business. Don't mm -hmm. get hooked on the money, you know? And yeah. uh, it was nice to make a lot of money. Uh, you yeah. develop a lifestyle around that. And uh, especially as a young guy and I really was enjoying myself in Hoboken, New Jersey there. And, um, but I, I had to double down with my passion to own real estate, own an investment company. And it was very hard to transition from being a realtor into raising capital, 
uh, buying income properties, teaming up with my business partner, Seth Martinez, mm -hmm. uh, developing our management company, which was extremely difficult and detailer oriented and still is uh, today. Uh, you got to stay on top of that full system and the staff as well. Yep. Um, so uh, that was the hardest part, you know, developing the infrastructure. And, and then as the infrastructure develops and the returns are produced for investors, it, it does get easier to raise capital. But it's still, you know, challenging every day, building relationships, mm -hmm. um, getting in front of the right people. You know, you do, we're not selling a pair of jeans over here, you know, it's minimum $30,000 investment. So you yep. be in front of the right people and, and it can't, they can't just have 30,000. We can't take all your capital, you know, so yep. we, it has to be someone that really is in a position to invest and be qualified. So yeah. Um, yeah. But raising capital, my friend is the, is the biggest and the hardest thing I've ever done in real estate. You know, it's, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I mean, as far as my experience as well, the first time raising capital was extremely difficult it does get easier, you know, and uh, it definitely gets easier as, as you keep on doing it um, and finding the right people. I mean, that's, that's also key as well. You know, I, I'm, I'm starting to, I, I think I built, uh, you know, started doing a lot of syndications where we'd bring the people in that could only afford one syndication, you know, and then, then you have to go out and find a whole new, you know, whole new group of investors for the next one. But uh, mm -hmm. I think part of that, when, when I'm looking for the right person, now I'm starting to look for the people that can invest in several syndications, you know, and that's, that's the right person for me now. So, right. Um, right. Yeah. So, so it, something that, uh, you know, we talked about prior to hitting the record button, you know, you're investing pretty much in your backyard, you're in New Jersey and you're investing in New Jersey. Um, why New Jersey? Well, we do have good infrastructure here. We've been investing in New Jersey for years and we've made our investors and ourselves millions in New Jersey. It's really a great market. It's uh, We work off the New York City metropolitan market, which mm -hmm. some say is the greatest city in the world. So mm -hmm. we don't buy in New York City We buy or the boroughs. We buy outside of New York City on the Jersey side, mm -hmm. um, generally within an hour's commute to New York City. So um, people's living habits have changed now with the, the coronavirus. You know, we, we've had people now moving out to like West Jersey a little more, and North Jersey and Central Jersey. So, um, you know, people that live in a city look at New Jersey as the country, you know, the suburbs of New Jersey. <laughs> right? It's yeah. really a, a beautiful state. I mean, you know, we get a bad rap because of uh, uh, Newark Airport there. Everyone flies into Newark Airport and yeah, that's a little industrial, you know, and there may be some bodies there, but that's just how, it, you know, don't mess with Tony Soprano. But, you know, at the end of the day, New Jersey is a lot of uh, wealth, a lot of education. It's a really uh, exciting state to live in, a uh, ton of stuff to do here. So, um, and, you know, we're a hop, skipping a jump to Manhattan. Although when you live in New Jersey, you kind of get tired of going to Manhattan. So it's not as cool mm -hmm. anymore, you know. Um, but uh, we, we really, this is a great market to be in if you know how to snag deals yeah. and work with red tape, you know. You know, I, I, a couple, couple of points there. I mean, New Jersey is the garden state, right? I mean... <laughs> That, that gives you the idea of something that actually looks nice. You know, you, you think of, you know, gardens as, you know, green and lush and not uh, concrete jungles. So I, I guess it's, um, you know, that part's at least true. But um, yeah, with, with COVID, I think that probably benefited you guys a lot. Um, you know, just, just the kind of the outward migration from the city center probably pushed prices up a lot. And you've been in the business for a while. So I assume you guys were on on the the right end of that one uh so to speak but uh yeah i think anyone that owned real estate in the last two years has been on the right end of it pretty much true 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 uh yeah i it, it's it's it was hard hard not to make money in the last two years if you have real estate with the way prices have gone um yeah i, I mean there there i still have one tenant and one court system that hasn't gotten it's ridiculous the newark uh, essex county court system is terrible they're so mm -hmm. backed up um and i have a, a lot of tenants that are great and paying worked out you know and gotten to hardship and we connect them to nonprofits or government assistance and everything worked out we got all the payment back to us that was owed but there's still one tenant who's taken advantage of the entire thing and yeah. hasn't paid a dollar the entire two years these courts are still backed up we haven't got a court date yet so you know you can still have challenges in real estate if you don't know how to manage properly or you've leased to the wrong people yeah. Yeah. And that, that's something that, that is important. You know, I think leasing to the right people, that's, that's, uh, 
Uh, something we realized early on is, you know, the, the property manager has standards for a reason, you know, or they should have standards for a reason. You know, I think uh, you, you want to make sure you're, you're filling the, the place with good tenants and um, that solves a lot of your problems. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so looking, looking at, I think a lot of, a lot of the buzz in the industry is, is around the, the Sun Belt, you know, the, the Texas markets, the Southeast, but uh, um, I, I think, that there's a lot of goodness, a lot, a lot of good things to be had, you know, right where you're at. You're close enough to New York City to be able to take advantage of, you know, everything that happens there. I mean, it's it is the the center of our financial markets, and you know, a lot of a lot of business, a lot of um, a lot of everything happens there. So, a ton of wealth, ton of, and you know, the yeah. demand is just so consistent in Orchard. There's so many people living here. They haven't built enough housing. It's kind of small. It's a small, so most densely populated state. So. Mm -hmm. If you can get into the development side of it, it's really just about, you know, it, it's not like it will there be demand on it. It's just what's the price you have yeah. to be, you know, the people line up out the door when you have a good asset and a good location. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's that's our goal. But it, it's it is tough. You have to mm -hmm. rent control changes from city to city. You have to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are like pockets of Jersey with no rent control and tons of demand. And um, you can invest uh, somewhat similar to how you're investing in the Sun Belt, but mm -hmm. you know you just have to know uh, how to navigate some red tape. Yeah. All right, interesting, interesting. So let's so while we're on the subject, let's talk about um, the type of deals that you do. So you know if if you could either pick one and go into detail, or just kind of tell us your overall philosophy on on finding properties. Uh, well, let's do that. Sure. So we focus on value add apartment buildings and mixed use mm -hmm. properties. And uh, just like the buildings you see behind me, I like the garden style apartment buildings. That's a really good way to go. And um, we look for properties that are just mismanaged. Maybe they're in foreclosure or just they're, they're um, have some vacancies or, or repairs that need to be done, or simply it's just not being leased for what it could be leased for. Those are really the best opportunities that don't need a lot of work. They just need improved management. Um, and improved tenant base. So th those are properties we, we search for. Um, it is hard to find a deal. The hardest part of our job is finding a good opportunity. Usually when we find it, we can uh, put together the capital very uh, quickly, but um, it has to be a good price. So the seller's got to be motivated. Um, it has to be something that also qualifies someone for a mortgage. So there is mm -hmm. some cash flow coming in. Yep. You know, We try to get as low interest mortgage as possible. We do sometimes go with bridge financing and that can increase your interest rate. Um, but you know, it's going to be a, a kind of slightly destabilized asset. We've bought properties that are not all that destabilized, maybe 15% below market value. And mm -hmm. you're really just working with your current tenant base and sprucing up the common areas and uh, units as they become vacant. Mm -hmm. And then we've bought the uh, more of a heavy lift, you know, 30% uh, below market value, uh, a quarter of the tenants aren't paying rent. Uh, mm -hmm. The building's kind of a huge mess and you're coming in and understanding there's going to be a lot of evictions, there's going to be a lot of renovation cap X uh, cost as well. And that might require a bridge loan or something like that. Um, or we'll just raise additional money for the CapEx. You know. Interesting. Interesting. Now, now something that I noticed a long time ago, you know, I, I'm assuming that New Jersey is also going to have a lower cap rate than, than a lot of other metros. Um, does that give you more bang for your buck when you're doing your value adds? Yeah, I guess that's a great way of looking at it, right? You know, because if you can increase the NOI on a property and mm -hmm. you do cap rate valuation, the higher the cap rate, the less of a multiplier you're getting yeah. out of your investment. So that's a great way of looking at it, Brian. I need mm -hmm. to bring you on when I'm talking to a, an investor, when they're like, yeah. should I invest in Texas or New Jersey? I should be like, well, here's why investing in lower cap rate property yeah. makes sense. Oh, you're good. You know, I, I had dinner. I, I wish I could take credit for that, but I had dinner with somebody a couple of weeks ago at a conference and, uh, you know, I, we were talking about where cap rates were going and, you know, very, very engaging, you know, conversation that everybody would love to have, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a nerd, but uh, we were all real estate investors and, yeah. you know, somebody mentioned, you know, what cap rates were doing in Europe and in Canada and how, you know, cap rates were in the one to two in some countries Wow. And one of the guys made that point. He's like, I would love to have a 1% cap rate. I'm like, that's like a dollar per dollar, you know, $1 in NOI adds, you know, what, you know, the, the multiple on that, you know, adds a hundred dollars in value. And that's, it's something that there, there are benefits to low cap rates. You know, when, when people are looking for high cap rates, you know, some, sometimes I kind of start scratching my head because, um, you know, the, the high cap rates are typically the properties you don't want to own and the lower cap rates, um, 
you, you get low cap rates for a reason. And one of the benefits in my mind is just that it's, yeah. you, you get a little more bang for your buck when, when you're doing the renovations. So yeah. one of many. Yeah, you're buying the right areas and you're talking about like a three-year reposition. Well, a lot of inner city areas over three years, a lot of things can change. So mm -hmm. we see development happening in these downtown areas. We see bullish mayors approving big developments and cranes in the air. And we say, well, we better be get in on that. We better start to buy apartment buildings around where this development's going on. Mm -hmm. Even though the schools may not be great, the crime might be high, you know, um, th those challenges are really in, in any inner city area. So yeah. we uh, work with that. And that's where we do some of our best work here in uh, New Jersey. You know, we actually don't buy the fanciest stuff. We're more mm -hmm. around class C, class B. Uh, we don't do class A uh, as much. We don't do class D uh, mm -hmm. really at all. So we'd like to find a nice uh, B minus, make it into a B plus, something like yep. that. That's our sweet spot. Nice, nice. And you, you bring up a good point. Uh, you know, if, if you're paying attention to, to what's going on at the city and county level, you can you can be ahead of the curve. You know, I was I was in D.C. and when they when they announced the extension of a metro line and by the time it was public knowledge, you know, the prices around where the, the new stations were going to be had already gone up. You know, it was like yeah. there there were a lot of people who were buying already and who had you know been paying attention to the plans and where things were going to start buying the land around the proposed stations that right. as soon as it was announced, though, I mean, the, the prices from the general public it skyrocketed. So. Good, good point there. And I, I, I've seen it happen firsthand, you know, on, on real estate. Um, yeah. But uh, so, you know, one, one question that I like to ask everybody, and it's, it's more of a motivation question, you know, kind of what, what motivates you? So what is your big burning why? Well, uh, I, I've always had a passion to own apartment buildings. Uh, as a child, I might, my dad owned a condo uh, in a big apartment complex. I've always wanted to own it. I've had visions of myself owning them and had to figure out how to do it. But I'd say my why really that keeps me going day in and day out is uh, my family. My, I just had a little boy with my wife. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. So, you know, beautiful uh, child and uh, family here, just such a, a nice experience. You just moved into a new home. So, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you see that and you have this uh, beautiful family. It, it's hard not to think, you know, hey, I, I better make that dollar. I better build a good business that uh, is ethical, um, you know, be the type of man you're, you'd want your son to be, you know, and also um, create a, a business that has assets and is, is a nice, profitable business. And maybe uh, when he gets older, you know, I can maybe not work so many hours per week and enjoy more time with my family, and my son and have the option to um, take time off when I want, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, just that freedom there, or, or maybe focus on, you know, a different business where I have more passions, uh, perhaps like uh, in motorsports or power sports or something like that, where, you know, I like to spend my time, my hobbies, you know, so nice. Or, nice. or just enjoy my hobbies more, you know, ride my ATV more, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah my, my, my wife's been pushing for us to, you know, buy an ATV for, for a while now. So next time a property sells, you might see a new one parked uh, in our garage. So it, um, yeah, it. hobbies, hobbies, family and hobbies, you know, I, lo I love it. But uh, all right. So last question before we bring Scott on and, you know, what's next for you? Sure. So at People's Capital Group, we are working on a fund right now. We are about to launch a $5 billion fund on August 1st. It's going to be a 506B. So we'll be accepting non-accredited uh, mm -hmm. investors as well as accredited investors. So, you know, we're People's Capital Group. So we work with sophisticated investors and the SEC describes them as individuals that have experience investing in real estate and have the ability to understand the investment opportunity and not need to like live on the returns of the investment. So that opens up the door to most people to be able to invest in our fund. And uh, it means we're not limited to accredited investors who are essentially our millionaires, people that make either 250 or $300,000 a year. So uh, we are open to all different types of investors with that. So that, that's what we're looking forward to uh, here in the immediate future. Um, over the next two years, we want to build our holdings to 50 million mm -hmm. and then 100 million by 2030. Um, we'll take our investors along for the ride. We want to build our investor base as well uh, through that time also. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I, I share your, your philosophy. I, I want to keep my investments open to non-accredited investors. I spent most of my life as a non-accredited investor, and I think I just barely checked that box uh, you know, less than a year ago. But uh, um, yeah, so I definitely appreciate uh, appreciate that. 
Yeah. Um, well, that said, we're going to shift gears a little bit and bring Scott on. So, Scott, thanks for waiting patiently by. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. And Aaron, thank you as well. Uh, really enjoyed hearing your story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to tell it. All right. Well, Scott, it's, it's uh, our turn now to hear your story. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, who is Scott Matthews, where you're coming from and what you're looking to do. Absolutely. So uh, I got my finance degree and immediately after I had my first job in accounting mm -hmm. and about three months into this accounting position, it was at an engineering firm in Atlanta, small business, like 100 employees. Um, I took on one of the largest projects that our company has ever seen in the accounting department. I was in charge of going through 30 years of accounting for our JV, and I recovered seven figures of uh, uncollected receivables and overpayments. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. They had no accounting system. I created the whole accounting system for them. Um, after one year of working in accounting, I decided this is not a good personality fit. This is not what I want to do the rest of my life. So I went into sales and I've been in sales ever since then. I've been in the mortgage industry and insurance, and then I went into real estate and it's surprising. It took me so long to get into real estate because half my family is in real estate. Um, I have two commercial brokers in my family. Mm -hmm. and uh and a couple of residential agents uh an appraiser it's it's really crazy it took me this long to get into real estate so um about a year into to my residential career i realized that we were meeting i, I mean a hot topic in these meetings is how to compete against these investment giants yeah. and you know zillow and open doors coming out and um we're having to sell ourselves and we're having to cut figure out ways to convince our clients that we're able to compete against them. We can offer the same exact things that they can offer. We can buy your house cash. We have investors behind us. And I said, there's got to be a better way. It seems like we're playing a team sport and each of these agents is playing individually. Mm -hmm. And as we know in team sports, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work well anyways. And so one of my friends recommended that I read a book about raising capital mm -hmm. and I ended up reaching out to the author, went through his mentorship program in Q1 last year and kept in touch with some of the guys. And then, uh, you know, that's how I, I met Brian was through one of our mutual connections, mm -hmm. got invited on as a beta tester for his Tribe of Titans forum, which is amazing. Thanks. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I always talk you up to everyone, man. Seriously. <laughs> um, and uh and then, yeah, I just landed my first general partnership uh, about two months ago, and it's mm -hmm. an international fund. And I would say it is the most complex thing I've ever been a part of. Anyway, let's uh, let's talk a little. You talked about you know where you came from, what you've been doing. Now let's talk about the the why behind it. What's what's your big burning why? It used to be a big house in a Maserati. Yeah, not anymore. Yeah. Not anymore though. Uh, I I've got a five month old boy. And mm -hmm. I want to spend more time with my wife and my my family. I want to, you know, I want to make sure to keep that relationship going. It's mm -hmm. marriage and and being a father is something that I view as a continuing continuing effort. It's not something that just happens and then mm -hmm. oh you get to coast through it. It's um, yeah. It, it requires time. It requires effort. I want to develop new skills. I want to learn new languages. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I used to think I wanted, you know, big house Maserati as well. I, I, I don't think that those really motivate people long term. You know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, one, once you start getting, you know, into bigger and bigger houses, it's more and more to clean. And then, you know, when, when, when the going gets rough, you're like, my Honda's just fine. You know, it's like, I don't really need that Maserati. So I, I found that, you know, a lot of times the, the material stuff, you know, doesn't motivate a lot. So um, I think for most people, it comes back down to what both you guys said, you know, you both talked about newborns and, you know, new kids. And it's, it's it, a lot of it's about family, about what you want to, you know, pass on to your, your children. And that ends up being, I, I would say about 90% of the big burning wise and 300 episodes have all been around family. I, I've got a friend that, that lives in Israel that I'm close with. I've known him 
since elementary school. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking to him earlier today and he said he's traveling the world with his Mm father-in-law and they have met so many interesting people. And he's saying that America is just one big bubble and we're stuck in the bubble. And we think that this is the only bubble that's, that's out there. And there's so many other interesting people to meet Mm -hmm. and we're so focused on collecting material goods here and it's not that's not the end and in fact when it does end you don't get to keep any of it and so that's the one thing that a lot of people have said they regret in America when they get older is that's that was their focus and so I don't want that to be my focus. I think it was uh in Stephen Covey's book he said you know nobody on their deathbed ever says I wish I would have worked harder you know I wish I would have spent more time at the office you know but uh yeah. So anyway, well, that, that said, Hey, Scott, we got Aaron on the line. What do you want to ask him? I want to ask him a lot more than I have time to, <laughs> I, I, want, want, I want to know about the future of multifamily and, and with you being in, in New Jersey in such a niche market. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I have a lot of respect for that. That's not easy to do what you're doing like and you. especially dealing with foreclosures and up in the Northeast. <laughs> um so, yeah you laugh at that it's it's serious <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a it's a crazy uh thing in in the northeast you can really i mean especially with covid you can basically live for free if you want to take advantage of the system you know yep yeah mm-hmm. so so what do you think about the future of multifamily in the next um in the next three to five years we'll say why why do you believe in it why do you think it's a solid buy what are you telling your investors Sure. So uh, the reason I got into real estate originally was because people need a roof over their head, whether there's a recession or not. You know, I did uh, enter the market in a terrible uh, mm-hmm. real estate recession. And even then, people still needed to buy a home. There were people getting new jobs moving in from out of state or even out of the country. Um, there were you know people moving upward, nonward. Um, so even in the worst real estate recession, people were still buying houses. They still need a place to live. But more importantly, if you couldn't buy a home, you needed to rent. So mm-hmm. um, I think rentals are kind of a shelter from the storm in a sense, especially if you don't own the fanciest real estate in town, class A, or the worst real estate in town, class D. If you're kind of in the middle of the road and uh, most people can afford your units and it's a safe, nice place to live, um, then for the most part, people are still going to need what you're selling, um, even in a recession. Mm -hmm. Uh, So are we going to get into a recession now? No one knows. Some people say we're already here. It doesn't really matter. The most important thing is that you have good assets with value add. You're not over leveraged. You have a good tenant base. Uh, You bought for the right price. You know, it makes sense that, and even when um, lease or um, mortgages come due, you know, maybe there's a a reset period or something with interest rates rising, Mm -hmm. you just have to be smart. You know, I mean, the truth is property values have gone up a lot more than we thought they would in the last Mm -hmm. three years. So our initial targets of like 2% inflation and like, you know, 2% market growth were way off, way too conservative. Uh, The market's been super hot in North Jersey, especially. So um, the property values are much higher than we thought they'd be. So interest rates are, are, are kind of all relative to that. Um, you're still going to get a, a lower mortgage amount because interest rates are higher, but the property's appraising for a higher price than you thought. So it all kind of be, evens out at the end of the day. And you know, over the next uh, three to five years, I think the market's going to come back. I think we're going to see about 18 months of hardship. Um, I think multifamily housing, the class B and C space is just going to kind of sail along. Uh, we're probably going to see rents stop growing. I don't think rents can keep growing at the rate they're at. But then again, who the heck knows? I mean, inflation's still six, seven, eight percent. You know, we're we're still looking at uh, upward pressure from how much it costs now to buy a home means more people are going to rent. So that's going to put continued upward pressure on rental prices. So, you know, I, I think it's actually a good, really good shelter from the storm right now if owning apartment buildings. Um, that's why we don't do office space so much or retail or things like that, because they are. Yeah. less uh, recession resilient than, than apartment buildings. That's why I like it. Yeah, I, I liked, uh, I mean, tweetable quote right there. You, you said the phrase, it doesn't matter. You know, I think that's one thing that's really nice about um, multifamily specifically is people have to live somewhere. And, and the harder it is to buy, the more people that are forced to rent. And as long as you have that cash flow coming in, you're able to, to meet your expenses. Um, I bought my first rental property, single family home in 2007. And 
I never worried about it because somebody else was paying my mortgage and they always paid. So, yeah, I mean, Aaron, I, I appreciate your answer. You gave a lot of the details and a lot of the fundamentals in there, but I think end of the day, you know, as, as long as you're sticking to the fundamentals, the fundamentals tell you it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. It's still a good time to buy, mm-hmm. um, especially if you have a three to five year horizon. Yeah. And that's it. I don't look at real estate as tomorrow. I'm not mm-hmm. like trying to really time the market. If I was, I wouldn't have been riding real estate for like the last two years, which would have been a, a poor decision. So, yeah. um, you know, if anything, you actually want to start buying soon, like now in the next six months, you know, get mm-hmm. your buying hat on. Um, I don't know how long the buyer's market is going to last for, you know, I mean, how stupid would you feel if you're like, wait and wait and wait and wait, and then the market like ticks up again and just takes off again for yeah. six more years, you know, and now you're paying whatever price it is then. So, you know, no, don't we, wait to buy real estate. We had this, right? buy real estate. I love that quote. Uh, I was just, just going to say with COVID, a lot of people paused, you know, and it turned out that you didn't need to pause during COVID. We don't know what's going to happen. Everybody's predicting, you know, recession. I think there's going to be a recession, but yeah, end of the day, I love that quote. Don't wait to buy real estate, you know, um, and then stealing another quote from Warren Buffett, you know, don't, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. You know? <laughs> yeah. Best time to buy real estate was 20 years ago. The best time right. to second best time is, is today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, like that. Um, back to you scott yeah no i I just want to add to that because uh so so with with your with your value add here and and you're you're buying b minus properties right sure do you do you feel like based on do you feel like based on brian's uh new conversation that he had with the you know, low cap rates, higher value add. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that might push you to go B minus to A? It's really about the deal. You know, I I would never turn down an A or even a D if there's, if there's huge value add at the right price. Mm -hmm. I also can always flip the property if I don't think it's a great like 20 year hold, but there's still value in it right now. I might, I might sell it in three years, you know, so I look at every single deal. Um, I love A real estate. It's easier to raise capital for A mm-hmm. real estate. It's more sexy. Mm-hmm. I look at our friend uh, Grant Cardone there. You yeah. know, he just yeah. does the A and like fucking. Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, pile drives like you know the, the text. Yeah. Uh, you know. So um, yeah, it, it's it's it, it's really all about um, the deal. You know, mm-hmm. A real estate can can work for sure. I'd love to take a B plus and make it into an A. I'd like that plan. Yeah. We, yeah. we had, spe- speaking of, you know, the sexy, sexy A class, we, we had one of our investors that was in the, the same city as one of our C class properties. And mm-hmm. this play was a C minus to a C plus is what we were trying to do. And so they drove by the property and texted me and said, man, it looked so much better in the pictures. I'm like, just wait till we're done with it. But I, I think you're right. It's, it's easier to raise for an A-class. People like the, the posters, you know, the, the really pretty pictures. And um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think I think really you, you, you go where the money is, you know, and if you're if you're flexible enough and you're able to recognize it, you go where the money is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And as far as as far as rent growth, I, I've been thinking this whole time it's based on uh, it's based on income. But like you said, um, you know, when when times are hard, people will step down to apartments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that if it becomes more expensive, if there is continued rent growth, there's just going to be more six figure earners. It's just a it's a moving scale. It's a, it's a moving yeah. range of income. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course. So I, I really think it's safe myself. I do. I I've had mixed emotions about it. Um, but after talking to you and Brian and yeah. having multiple conversations on the tribe of Titans forum, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm almost completely confident. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to think of it all relative. Like what are your options? You know, you can invest in an index fund. And that's pretty solid. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. But over like a 20 year period, you know, you'll probably see a good amount of like eight to 10 percent growth over time. You could buy like a whole life insurance policy and be like guaranteed four percent growth or a bond or something like that. And you guarantee three percent, you know, and that's going to be super safe. But that's not really going to keep up with at least where inflation is or not going to make you rich overnight. You know, so 
that real estate, you know, a lot of my investors are earning 15% annualized cash and cash returns, uh, internal rates returns in the low 20s. Uh, they're completely passive options. Um, so, you know, you can get those returns in high risk stocks. You can get that like a really savvy options trader or something like that, you know, but um, you're probably not going to get that in index funds. Uh, you may have been able to get that in crypto, but forget that. I lost my shirt in crypto. I'll never invest in it again. And uh, it's basically like, what are your options really? You know, that's why real estate is yeah. so tried and true. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's a full-time job doing your due diligence on those guys, because if you want to relate them to operators, they mm -hmm. are operating your portfolio from a, a different investment standpoint. And how do you know if you're working with an expert or a really good salesperson? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of these guys are taking brokerage fees just to take them. And they're yeah. not really doing much for your portfolio. And I'm talking about in out, outside of real estate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, something that I learned, and this is part of the rich dad, poor dad thing. Actually, my dad taught me this, you know, never take, take, take advice from people who are where you want to be. Mm -hmm. I've had several financial advisors and financial planners come to me and want to get my business. And the first thing I ask for is their balance sheet. You know, mm -hmm. and that tells me if I want, you know, if I want them handling my money, you know, sure, it's, it's sure. like, yeah, so that's, that's actually, um, I haven't had a single financial planner show me their balance sheet yet, you know, and it's just like, uh, Mike, you know, I'll show you my, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to be showing you mine. I want to know, I want to make sure you can handle what's on my balance sheet. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it gets a lot of financial planners backpedaling, but, uh, anyway, yeah, that's, possibly. that's how you do it is my, my answer. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. So Aaron, let's talk about evaluating potential partnerships and evaluating expertise because the market's gone up. It's gone up for the past decade and it may continue up. It may go down. But what we're seeing right now, a lot of people with, uh, with you know, less than 10 years of experience, a lot of them may not know exactly what to do right now. Yeah. So do you think? Well, I think it, it's okay to sometimes sit back and wait for more data. Um, there's a lot of information we're waiting on right now. Inflation numbers, jobs numbers, the effects of the 75 basis points the Fed just increased the uh, interest rate by. Is that having the effect we all think it is? I, mm -hmm. I think it is, and, and at least in my circle of people I'm talking to, um, yeah, uh, my realtors say their open houses are empty where they used to be packed with fun, yeah. you know, or their listings are not getting the bids they used to get there, having those conversations with their sellers saying you got to come down 5%. Um, so uh, then on, on the commercial side, I'm seeing buildings go into foreclosure a little bit here and there. Um, deals come out of the woodwork. Um, uh, sellers are coming down in price. You know, uh, there was a perfect example of a seller that had a building for sale for, a, he got an offer of like 14 and a half million uh, he felt like he had underpriced the building, so he took it off the market, put it back on at 16 and a half million, and now he's trying to get 13 and a half. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, so just a classic example of being greedy in a hot market, you should have taken what you had. So, um, you know, we're seeing those deals now, and at 13 and a half, we like passed on it because of interest rates are now higher. Uh, it was low cap property. So we're being very picky. Um, we're sitting in the wings. I'm starting a fund. I'm putting together a war chest of cash. So when we find the right deal, we can strike on it quickly. Um, and I wouldn't wait too long, uh, but I think in the next uh, three to 18 months, you're going to see a lot of buying opportunities. And right now you should probably be putting it together your capital or calling up your rich uncle and talking about how you guys can do some real estate deals together. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good time to grow your network and, and find them more investors. Well, we are about out of time. So I think that's a really good note to end it on. Um, actually, I will throw one comment in there. You know, you talk about the the owner that was a little bit greedy, but uh, I mean, if he bought in 2018, 2019, you know, he's still going to make a lot of money, you know, when he sells, you know, but uh, yeah. um, anyway, we, we are out of time. And I uh, do want to thank both of you guys for coming on the show. We've got one last question for each of you. Um, Aaron, you go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Sure. So our website is peoplescapitalgroup.com. We have tons of webinars on there about real estate investing. We have a weekly podcast, a weekly blog. 
So just a ton of free content. We don't sell coaching or education. We just focus on helping people invest in real estate. We accept accredited and non-accredited investors. So it's peoplescapitalgroup.com. That's our website. And um, yeah, check out our content, follow us there, download our ebook. Uh, you can schedule a call with me, Aaron Fragnito. And once you're qualified, you can check out our upcoming offerings and learn more about the fund we're starting as well. Um, so that's uh, peoplescapitalgroup.com. All right. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. So um, just you know, hit the show notes, swipe down, tap, and the internet will whisk you away. But uh, same question for you, Scott. How can listeners learn more about you? Absolutely. So um, embarrassingly, I am working on my website right now. It is not up and running. So you can, in the meantime, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash S dash Matthews. All right. And we will put a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, so people can just, you know, tap and tap or click and, you know, have it whisk you away. So um, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Very much appreciate, uh, you know, both of you for spending some time with me this afternoon. Thanks, Brian. Had a good time. Always enjoy it. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of Titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to the tribe of titans.info and we'll see you there.